This is Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag. I'm your host, Clint Schaffer, and today we're going to be talking with Aaron Holbert from Indiana, discussing things like farming, social media, and even starting your own business. It's going to be a great conversation. Let's get to it. Aaron, welcome to Around the Farm here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so uh, how about you, uh, you introduce yourself to the uh, to the listeners here? Tell us a little bit about where you're from, what you do. So I'm Aaron Holbert. I was born and raised in Dana, Indiana. Went to Purdue University, the best ag school in the country. Uh, got a degree in ag business um, and agronomy. Um, and then went to be an agronomist up in Michigan for Cargill for a while before coming back to the area um, and working as a DSM for a regional seed company. Decided I'd had enough of that and came back to the family farm. Nice, nice. What, what kind of crops do y'all grow? So we are strictly corn and soybeans. Um, that's it. If, my dad always said, if you have to fence it or feed it, you don't need it. So all of my ideas for livestock over the years were shot down. <laughs> well, there's there's some uh, there's some truth behind that. I tell you what, livestock definitely adds a whole nother level. Uh, we we raised cattle and goats up until probably uh, early two thousands, and uh, I swear we spent more time either fixing hot wire or you know chasing chasing cattle that were out. Uh, it, it always adds a little bit of, a little bit more to it. Yes, and now that I'm back on the farm full time, realizing just how busy we are with the acres of corn and soybeans that we grow, I don't ever see how I thought that would be feasible anyway. <laughs> so, uh, how, how's the season been going? I mean, kind of what what stage are the crops at around you? And how are how are they looking? And uh, kind of how the spring go? Um, I'm gonna be real honest. The whole year has been a mess. Um, starting with harvest last year, it was just too wet to get any of that ground work down after harvest, um, which did put us behind a little bit this spring. Um, things were super wet. We kind of, we got a decent start, um, but it, it just stayed so wet that it drug on for a long time. We started in April and finished uh, the first week of June. Um, I had a few hundred acres of bean replants. My dad had to plant in some corn. Um, and now after all that rain, we were just so wet for months and months. Uh, we are way too dry. We are just praying for a rain because right now it looks like we're growing pineapples. So hopefully, hoping it doesn't turn into another 2012. Yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, that, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you hate seeing your crops stressed, uh, especially after it's been, you know, that, that stressful of a, of a planting season as well. You, you hope to hope to start getting some rain there. Um, as far as for the for the replant, was it just from from emergence and and uh, and just being too wet at the at the time of planting? Yeah, mainly the the biggest area replant we had. I think I replanted two hundred acres in that field. Um, I had planted it, and not even an hour after I finished planting it, we just got a huge unexpected pop up. Um, I think we got like an inch of rain in ten minutes, and it just pounded that into the ground and turned it to concrete. Um, and so those beans did not come up well. Yeah. I, I was, uh, watching, uh, Twitter, you know, this, uh, this spring, I seen uh, a few folks getting rotary hose out for, for those, uh, those reasons. Right. And that's, uh, that's always a hard decision yes. to make, you know, I mean, what do you, what do you do? And replant is never fun. So we, no, it's not. We consider getting, uh, the rotary hoe out, but, I feel like more times than not in those situations, it's just to make the farmer feel better that they're doing something to try to help. Um, But in the end, I feel like it ends up about the same result. Yeah. That's a piece of equipment that like every farmer owns and like never wants to use. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of like the reel on the corn head in the fall. Oh, yes. Yes. That, that as well. That is another one of those dreadful pieces of equipment. So, well, you know, talking about just on the on the replant side, it, how is you know when when we look at uh, this year, you know, spe- especially just going into this season, kind of maybe planning out uh, the the twenty two season. Um, how did you and your you know you and the farm you know kind of look at some of the rising input costs and and make different assessments on that? Did you 
did that end up changing your plan any as as you started getting into the season? Um, a little bit. For the most part, this year we're sticking um, with what we've done in the past. It's worked for us, um, and you don't want to get five years down the road and end up with your nutrients in the fields depleted because you had to cut back so much for a few years. So um, the main thing that we changed was we run in furrow uh, fertilizer in the corn planter. So instead of running 1034-0, we switched to a cheaper option this year. So that was the main thing. Um, but so far, this year anyway, um, we've pretty much kept things the same. But, you know, of course, the same rate of nitrogen down on all the corn acres before we planted. Um, but I do foresee things next year. Um, a lot of farmers are going to have to be making big changes um, because all those costs are going to just skyrocket again, especially seed. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, I-, I-, I would imagine, you know, you talked about uh, being a, uh, an agronomist by, by trade there. Um, I mean, that- that's got to be incredibly beneficial to have a, a professional uh, agronomist like on staff at the farm at all times, right? Um, I'm not so sure because I think those three and a half years in college, uh, they don't really mean much compared to my dad's 40 years of real life experience. So, um, he still, he still gets me every time. (laughs) Yeah. Understand. Understand. Well, I do have to ask a really important question here about, uh, we always have the, the argument on here and the debate of what is it called? And if we look at an auger wagon or a grain cart, where do you sit on on, on this one? So I'm going to throw you for a loop here. Uh, we call it an auger cart in this area. Oh, it's like a mix. It's like a mix right there. Yes. Right. Yep. So All really, right. if you think about it, we take from each one. So we're we're right. <laughs> Hey, there you go. There you go. That, that's a good way of looking at it. So we'll 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 have to create another category of of auger auger cart now, you know, and start start keeping tallies. I think I'm on the auger wagon side, and I think there's only like I'm standing alone on this right now. So I'm I'm just trying to find somebody that says auger wagon as well. Well, I tell you what, the the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, I know that you have just, a, you have grown your, your social uh, following. Um, I know you have, I think you're close to like 35,000 followers on Twitter. You have a, an amazing Instagram uh, that, uh, that you build up as well. And along with that has, has really, it seems like, uh, given you the opportunity to, to kind of have you, your own business as well. So uh, I think it's part of the Midwest. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of how that got started and, and how's it going? Yeah, so it actually started before my any of my social medias took off. Um, I don't even think I had a thousand followers on Instagram um, when I started it. And it was just one of those things. I saw all these cute t-shirts um, for livestock people, you know, with cute cows and pigs and bandanas. But there was never anything for us row croppers. So I had a couple ideas bounce around in my head for um, a few years, actually, before I finally got the guts up. You know, I said, you know what, I'm just going to order 50 shirts total of two different designs. And if they sell, that's awesome. And if not, I know what I'm giving to my family, like my entire family for Christmas. (laughs) Um, But they sold out within an hour and a half. And I thought, oh, man, I might have something here. Um, And then it snowballed from there. It got really hard to find t-shirts and materials for those um, because I try to keep it all local and support other local businesses and my printing and things like that. Um, so I added the boutique part of it just to keep it going um, because things kind of got a little uncertain for a while um, and are still, we have a hard time finding things to print on. And they predict that that's going to last for another year or so. So just like agriculture, I guess the t-shirt t-shirt business is kind of struggling. Well, I, I tell you what, that's just uh, that, that's awesome. Just to build up, uh, you know, build up a business like that, find a, a market, and uh, and I think people are just you know, sounds like everybody's uh, loving your designs and loving your products. I do want to ask about the designs, though. I mean, who who creates them? I mean, are you a are, are you a pseudo artist as well uh, on the side here? No, that's been the worst part is I, my dad was just complaining to me yesterday that I am not technologically savvy at all. And I was supposed to be a benefit coming back to the farm in that way. But he's still light years ahead of me when it comes to 
iPads and computers and technology. So that's been the hardest part is having to teach myself how like graphic design and things. So um, yeah, reaching out to some friends that have you know, more background on that and having them walk me through and watching just hours of YouTube videos to figure it out. Um, just to try to be able to put my own ideas on paper versus just outsourcing it and have it be someone else's. Isn't it amazing this day and age, uh, if you want to learn how to do something, you YouTube it. It's like somebody, somebody is out there teaching you how to do absolutely everything. Oh yes. It's a godsend. It's I use it for so many things because uh, I try to be too independent when I shouldn't be. Like I should have just gone and taken a course in graphic design, you know, someplace or had my dad or someone come out to fix my toilet. But, I, you know, I convinced myself that with YouTube, I can do it all. Absolutely. I, I, I'm in the same boat. I, I do a lot of my own work and uh Everything is assisted by a YouTube video. <laughs> so th thanks to all those YouTube creators out there pushing out great content. So actually, I'd like to talk about content. So we talked about your social, uh, you know, how, how you build up your social network and uh, and you have just, a, like I said, great successful pages. Uh, how did you kind of start looking at that and say, hey, I want to grow my Instagram channel or I want to grow my Twitter followers? Uh, was that intentional or did it just kind of kind of start growing on its own. It it honestly just kind of did it on its own. I remember, I guess it was February of 2020, the Indiana Soybean Association um, got a few bloggers and creators from Indiana farmers together. Um, and, you know, they made us all like put down our goals and stuff for the year. And I think that my, I had 2,500 followers and my goal was to get to 5,000 followers by the end of um, 2020 on Instagram, just speak more as a way to grow my business um, than my social media. Yep. And I think it was two months later, I had over 10,000 followers. And I think that I, at that point, I'd started sharing more of my day to day life on the farm and what I was doing and actually out in the field. And I think that um, it just kind of resonated with people. I, I didn't really sugarcoat anything. It's really easy to romanticize the farm life. And I'm going to say it, it was a struggle. It still is coming back to work with your family every single day. Um, you know, when you spend all of your time together, you know, I always, people get mad, but I always say the best Father's Day gift I can give my dad is to just not see him the entire day because after, you know, planting <laughs> season, we're so sick of each other. You know, we just need a break. <laughs> I, I said, I, I could definitely relate to that. It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I just shared that a lot on there and other other people that had come back to the family farm were like, oh yeah, yep, I get that. <laughs> and I think it just snowballed from there um, across all social media. I always think the one of the neatest parts about uh, about social media in general is just being able to connect people from all over the world, right? Um, and, and being yes. able to interact with folks. I watch people meet up for the, you know, they've interacted and they're both influencers. And then all of a sudden you see a post where they were close to each other. So they ended up meeting up and in person for the first time. And I just, I find it fascinating to see how some of those relationships are built. And again, just connecting people just all across the globe. I think that's just uh, such a cool time that we live in. Yeah, actually, Laura Farms, um, I'm sure everyone knows her. Um, I, we actually followed each other on Twitter before she ever started her um, YouTube account. Um, because her dad, her dad and I followed each other. She was still in high school. So it's been really fun to like know her as like the little high school sophomore junior and then just watch what she's done over the past few years. Um, and we actually just got to meet for the first time um, at the Farm Machinery Show in Louisville in February, but it, it felt like we already knew each other. So yeah, it was pretty fun. But I will say for the most part, um, you know, you, I've met a lot of really great people. I have a lot of really great friends from all over the country um, that I just met through, you know, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I just went on a weekend retreat, retreat with a bunch of people from Wisconsin and Illinois this past winter. And that was so much fun. We all met on, um, on Instagram with cranberry growers, dairy farmers, the whole range of things, um, got together and just hung out for the weekend. 
Well, I would assume what also helps is when you get pictures of these adorable little raccoons that uh, that you got as well. I I, I I gotta know. I mean, where 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 did you get these at? Uh, yes, those definitely help. I think half of my YouTube subscribers came for the raccoons. Um, it started out. I don't even remember what year it was. Um, I went outside one morning. I was still selling seed and. My dog, at that point, I thought she'd found a kitten. Um, Nope, it turns out that she stole a baby raccoon from the nest, um, just wanted it to be her buddy, and was trying to take care of it. And I was like, oh, man, I know they're a nuisance, but I feel so guilty that my dog just stole this raccoon. Like, even if I could find the nest, the mom's not going to take it back. So I threw the raccoon in a box. The eye, his eyes were still closed, and I stopped at Rule King on my way to my sales calls that day to get some formula and a bottle, and it just kind of went from there, and um, they were a lot of fun, and I think I've had four or five since then, um, so I was pretty bummed this year. I didn't have any. I guess I got a reputation. Um, if you search me on Yahoo. The neighbor found this out. If you search Aaron Holbert, the first thing that comes up is raccoon lady. So I'm not sure that that's really how I want to go down in internet history, especially when you Google who the raccoon man is, but you just, I guess we'll have to embrace it. Oh, you know, it's it's just part of it, right? I do have to say, this is a, a fun little fact. I, I have actually raised, uh, I think we've raised three raccoons uh, myself. So uh, growing you? up, we had them on the farm uh, a couple different times. And uh, one of them that we had, we had a set of twins. And I was probably, probably close to 16. And I would be on the four-wheeler running through the pasture checking hot wire for those cattle that we were talking about. And they would literally, I would have a raccoon baby on both sides of my shoulders and they would just be crawling over my head as I'm, you know, flying down the field, you know, checking hot wire. They are some of the most fun pets that you can have. You do got to watch out when they get, uh, get bigger, of course. But uh, man, they are they are yes. just so, so unique on, on how they just handle everything. I, I think raccoons are just so adorable. Oh, they're a blast for sure. Well, I guess the last couple of questions that I'd love to ask is really around uh, around Climate Field View, because I think uh, y'all use that on your operation. Uh, how did how'd you start utilizing Field View on your, on your farm? So I will say my dad, um, he's in his 60s, but he's always been really good at jumping on things as soon as they come out. Um, he's definitely not one of the people that lags behind. Uh, if he can see a year or two of proven data, He's going to want to try it out if it makes sense for the operation. So honestly, I don't really remember a time without field view, if that makes sense, um, since I've been back on the farm um, more frequently as I've gotten older. Um, so the past couple of years, we'd gotten a new bean planter and I didn't um, get to run field view in the bean planter. So getting it back this year, honestly, I was so happy. Um it makes my life a lot easier, and my dad, my dad likes to be able to see what I did. It's really great when he he'll call and be like, "Why did you do that that way?" So that's been the one downside of going back to field view in the beam planner is him being able to see things uh, that I don't want him to see until he goes through in the combine when my mistakes will be a little less noticeable. <laughs> Yeah, you know it's it's always fun when you can go back and you can see that. You know, I, I know I've planted a few uh, fields for Dad, uh, and it's one of those where he's like, "Why did you open it up that way?" Like I went the I went the opposite way around the field opening up than what he has for the last like you know forty fifty years. So it's uh it's always funny that you have like that record that trail they they can see it all at that point. <laughs> Yes, exactly. He's, yeah, I'll play in a corner. And he was like, why would you do it that way? And I was like, in the moment, it felt right, Dad. Like, What, what, would, be your, what would be your favorite feature that, uh, the, that they have in field view? I really love um, using it for replant or scouting. Um, just because we use it a lot of replant. Like if I am still planting and my dad will take the other iPad out, um, where you just, you know, you just have to replant random places throughout the field and he'll like put pins down um, just so I have a good idea and I can just kind of follow those pins um, and not miss anything. 
So that's been really helpful. And then scouting, we use it a lot if we do different trials, like different seed treatments, different beans, untreated versus treated, things like that. And the same with corn, um, fungicide, no fungicide, things like that. So that's really helpful throughout the season just to like kind of keep progress of how things are pro- going. Um, and then come fall, running it through with the combine, being able to have that map right there. and You can lay those or put those maps side by side and see exactly the yield difference. Absolutely. Yeah, just having having just access to uh, to all of your records, right, and a and a touch of a of a button, um, whether it's on your phone or iPad, um, being able to make those decisions. I mean, we we feel the same way. I mean, just utilize it. Once you use it, you, it, it, it's hard not to, right? Yes, and it's been really helpful. I think we've had. My dad said I was the bad luck charm coming back to the farm every every year since I've come back. It's been a struggle. Um, so we've used it a lot the past few years to the printouts for the insurance crop insurance guys. Um, they love it. We love it. It makes both our lives easier. So Aaron, we talked about uh, all these social media platforms. How uh, how can our listeners go out and uh, and find you? And uh, what, what's your handle? And what are all the platforms that you're on? Yeah, so I go by Aaron Holbert on pretty much everything. Aaron Holbert was already taken, so we just had to knock the eye out of there. Um, I go by Heart of the Midwest on Facebook and just Aaron Holbert on YouTube. And and speaking of YouTube, you have uh, 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 kind of a special event coming up here. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I do. So when I first started my YouTube channel, I started getting all of these random gifts and packages in the mail, which I really appreciated. Um, but I've been fairly blessed in my life. So I decided, you know what, I don't really, I don't need any of these things, however much fun it is to open up those packages. Um, so I kind of got to brainstorming and I put together an Amazon wish list for a local, um, nonprofit that my grandma was always really involved in. Uh, it started out as just a Christmas toy drive for, um, it's called kid care and they serve us, I think, four counties. Um, we have, I think, Vermillion County, the county I live in, has the third highest poverty rate in Indiana. Um, so it definitely benefits a lot of kids in the area. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. And um, yeah, so coming up next is our school supply drive. So I'll be putting those, those links on my upcoming YouTube videos for the next month or two. That is that is absolutely awesome. So that um, it's great when you can have a platform to to help out the community. I mean, I think that's just uh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely feels good to be able to give something back. Well, Aaron, thank you for taking time out of your day to to come on here and, and talk to us on around the farm. Uh, I wish you the absolute best of luck this season. I'm going to be uh, sending some prayers your way to get some rain. So, uh, so hopefully, you guys can get some uh, get some moisture over there. Thank you. We appreciate it, and thanks so much for having me on today. Hey, a big thank you, Aaron, for joining us here today. And be sure to go out there and follow her on all those social media platforms. And also a big thank you to you, the listener, for joining us. And be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and share it with a friend or two along the way as well. And also, as always, Around the Farm is brought to you by Climate Field View, and you can listen to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts at. And until next time, we'll see you around the farm.